Praise the Lord. Thank you, worship team. It is such a privilege to be able to have uh, Pastor Don Emma with us this morning. And he was here, I think, once when he was secretary treasurer. Um, this is the first time he's been here since he's been superintendent. But I, I had the privilege of serving under him um, from 2007. I was elected secretary of the section at that time. And I, I have just learned so much uh, sitting under him and serving uh, him through the years and have just so appreciated his spirit and his love for people and mostly his love for the Lord. And so give him a warm welcome this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Tim. And Pastor Tim and Darla, what a wonderful ministry couple you have leading your church. Yeah, give them a hand, that's for sure. We just love Pastor Tim and his, his gentle spirit and his faithfulness. Uh, one of the things that uh, Pastor Tim does is he serves our section now as the presbyter. And uh, that's code for more work. It's like pastoring your own church, but also being a resource to churches that are uh, in, in need of various resources. But usually... Uh, the presbyter is uh, called on when a church is going through transition or difficulty. And uh, those moments, they, they test us, they stretch us, they uh, cause us to lean closer to Jesus so that we can help people with, you know, uh, when I was a presbyter, my, my greatest fear was doing damage <laughs> to those that we were trying to help. And, uh, but Pastor Tim does such an awesome job, and uh, he helps us on a, on a district level. There's oh, 27, 28 churches in this section, uh, and uh, we have about 400 churches, uh, Assembly of God churches throughout Pennsylvania and Delaware. About 1,200 uh, ministers uh, serve in those churches, and literally tens and tens and tens of thousands of people who uh, gather together every Sunday to worship in, uh, in an Assembly of God church. And uh, it really is our privilege to somehow serve the Lord in this capacity and to be a resource and to work with such a fine leadership team. We call those that leadership team our presbytery. And there are 15 presbyters that uh, serve our sections and a couple of our uh, demographic groups like under 40 and ethnic uh, fellowship as well as our female credential holders. So uh, anyway, the presbytery is uh, our, our structure, our board, uh, fellow servants, and uh, uh, Pastor Tim is one of our presbyters. We love you, Pastor. Thank you for your service. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go to Acts chapter eight, verses four through eight, to this morning, and uh, I want to talk about the message that you carry. How many of you know that the way that we live our life, the way that we walk this journey, is constantly speaking? It's a testimony. It's a message. It is. Uh, uh, we hope that our life message is reflective of God's redemptive purpose being lived out, grown, and developed in our lives so that as we live for Jesus and as we witness, as we speak for him, other people will see Jesus in us. And we will have open doors of opportunity to share his story with them. So this morning's title is The Message You Carry. All of us have a life message. Sometimes our life message really is kind of summarized, uh, this is a little morbid, at our funeral. And even more so, sometimes it's, it's reduced to a sentence and placed in granite or concrete in a tombstone. There's some humorous epitaphs I want to share with you this morning. And uh, uh, some are a little, a little salty. Uh, one, one person put on their uh, uh, tombstone, now leave me alone. It tells a little bit about their life, doesn't it? 
Here's another one. Oh, nuts, did I leave the stove on? <laughs> another one wrote, can I get a do-over? The answer is no. Once you're done, it's over. <laughs> There's somebody put on their, their loved one's tombstone, duck. <laughs> Apparently they didn't. Here's a few, uh, uh, a little more poetic. Here lies Anne Mann, who lived an old maid, but died an old man. Think about it, it's cute. Here's another one. Beneath this sod, a lump of clay lies Arabella Young, who on the 21st of May began to hold her tongue. Okay, a little commentary on her life. Here's another, this is this is bad. The children of Israel wanted bread. The Lord sent them manna. Old Clark Wallace wanted a wife. The devil sent him Anna. And this is local. This one is uh, reported to be near Uniontown, Pennsylvania. A gravestone reads this. Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake. He stepped on the gas instead of the brake. I love uh, 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 Billy Graham's wife's epitaph. She, uh, Ruth Graham, was driving and um, was driving through road construction and when she came to the end of the construction, there was a sign and it said, end of construction, thank you for your patience. And so she had on her tombstone, construction over, thank you for your patience. And that's sweet. We're writing our epitaph as we live. What are we writing? What's the story of our life? There are many nuances to the chapters that you're writing out as you live this life. What is your life message? What is your narrative? If your story could be summed up in a few paragraphs, and someday it will, what will it read? What will it sound like? This morning, we're going to Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, and this is the story of Philip. Not many people get a whole chapter in the Bible. But Philip got a whole chapter. And, and uh, Acts chapter 8 uh, kind of expands on the life that Philip was uh, uh, living, the story he was living out. And let me give you a little bit of background on Philip. He was a deacon. There was an apostle named Philip also, but we know from the earlier verses in chapter 8 that this is not the apostle Philip because uh, the Bible tells us, Luke tells us, that all of the apostles were still in Jerusalem. But this was a different Philip, and he is listed among the deacons in uh, in. Acts chapter 6, we learn uh, that this is Philip, and uh, as I said, we know that he was a deacon, and in order to be a deacon, there were three criteria listed in Acts chapter 6, so we know that he fulfilled those criteria to become a deacon, so we know a little bit about the general reputation of this deacon named Philip. First of all, uh, in order to be a deacon, you had to have a good reputation. You had to be reputable. And so uh, we know that that's the type of person Philip was. Secondly, uh, a criteria to be a deacon was you had to be filled with wisdom. And so they had to be people of common sense, good judgment, Wisdom. So we know that that's the kind of a guy Philip was also. And thirdly, he had to be a spiritual person because one of the criteria was he had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was reputable, he was sensible, and he was spiritual. Those three characteristics marked his life so that he was chosen from the church to serve in this role of deacon. What excites me about Philip and this story that we're going to uh, delve into today is that Philip was not a clergyman. He was not an apostle. He was not a pastor. He was just 
one of the guys serving the Lord as best he could and uh, needing to get out from underneath the stress and strain of persecution. And so persecution, for one reason or another, caused him to leave Jerusalem and find himself in Samaria. Uh, the reason this encourages me, and I hope it encourages you today, is you do not have to have certain letters before your name in order for Jesus to use you. Can I get a good amen? Amen. You do not need to have REV in front of your name. Now, we, we thank the Lord for our pastors and for our ministers, those who are called to serve in a full-time capacity. They're honorable and they need to be respected and honored. We get that. But sometimes we have elevated the ministry and those ministers to a place where we feel that they're perfect. They walk on water. I've walked on water several times, by the way. I wanna, the lake was frozen. It was January, and so I walked. But God wants to use all of us. Can I get a good amen? He wants to use the body of Christ in its fullness. And Acts chapter 8 testifies to that very reality. Let's turn there. Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Would you kindly stand with me one more time as we honor God's word and its reading? I'm reading from the New Living uh, Translation. Please follow along with me in your Bible. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Pause. Those are our marching orders. Share Jesus everywhere you go. They did. They preached, they shared, they spoke about the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Isn't that the way it ought to be? Lord, I pray that you will take your word, apply it to our life context, and help us to live for you. I pray that what Philip experienced will be duplicated, replicated again and again in the church of today. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Three things about this story that I think that we ought to uh, bear witness to, we ought to repeat. Number one, Philip proclaimed the gospel. He effectively presented it. He preached. He preached the word. He preached the Christ. He preached the good news, the gospel. How many of you know our world needs the gospel today? The world needs good news today. All you have to do is turn on the 6 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news and you'll find that there are many bad things and they're always happening. And sometimes we in the body of Christ, we kind of get swept up into what's happening in the culture, but we're called to present good news we're not given the details, but it appears that Philip had a platform for preaching. And his message was clear enough that as we read the rest of this chapter, we learn multitudes responded to him presenting the gospel, and, the, and then they were baptized. So that was a, a one-two punch. People being uh, receptive to the gospel and then acting upon it by going through the waters of baptism. What kind of uh, message are you and I known for? You, you, we may never stand in an open market setting before a crowd of people. 
may never get behind a pulpit or a lectern, but our words and the way that we live our life preach loudly. Can I get a good amen? It proclaims who we are and what we believe. And dear, dearly beloved, be careful about the, the stickers you put on the back of your car. Right? Because you have to live up to them. And if we, a honk if you love Jesus. I heard about somebody who had a honk if you love Jesus on the back of their car. And somebody was honking behind them. And they turned around and went, <laughs> they forgot they had the bumper sticker on their car. They thought the person was being impatient. We need to be aware that how we live our life and how we respond to people out in the marketplace. And hey, you know what? I'm as guilty as the next person, right? Well, thank you for those amens. I really appreciate that. I was uh, at a gas station, and uh, we have a motor home. Oh, this, by the way, is uh, Utah. We were, in, we were coming back from this trip, uh, and so I was filling up the, uh, the motor home, and... Um, people, you know, go at their pace. And so I'm at third in line. There's a guy at the pump. There's somebody in between. And then there's me. And I like to make use of my time. So I just put the motor home in park. And I'm texting. And I'm doing what I'm doing. And the guy at the pump was done. So he pulled forward. Now, by the way, there's only one pump at this gas station that my that my 32-foot motorhome will fit in, so I have to go to the end and there, and so uh, everybody else moved up, and I was finishing my text, and somebody just slipped right in. My, my, my. The things that go on inside of our head, and I'm thinking, are you stupid or ignorant? I'm sorry, that is what I was thinking. And a little bit later, it starts to boil. Am I alone or do I have any company here today? Do you know what I'm talking about? All right, thank you for those kind comments. And then I just... I had a moment. The Holy Spirit won that day. We all make mistakes, right? Sometimes we're the offended and sometimes we're the offender. And so uh, we all pull up and this lady gets out of her car and she looks at me and goes, sorry. Just, you know, kind of humble and contrite, and I blew it. I wasn't paying attention. I, yeah, 32-foot vehicles, kind of hard to miss. But, uh, but everybody makes mistakes, right? So that was one day where, you know, the Holy Spirit won. And we'll have those moments every day of our life, whether it's in traffic or in Walmart or wherever we may be, you're, you're preaching the gospel with how you respond to life. Someone wrote this little poem, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. And the best of all preachers are those who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. Yeah, I'd rather see a sermon lived out, walked out, than to hear one barked out. 
I love the story about an evangelist who was preaching and he was all full of emotion and power and vim and vigor. And in those days, these all had cords. And he was walking back and forth across the platform and he's shouting and spitting. And there was a little girl in the pew with her mom and she said, Mom, if he gets loose, will he bite us? <laughs> you and I are, Paul calls us epistles read of men. 2 Corinthians 3, 2. We are a living book. And the story of the gospel isn't just the scriptures that we've memorized and the witness that uh, is structured and effective, but friends, it's the kindness, it's the way we live it out that will open people's ears and open their hearts because they're evaluating the validity of our testimony by the way that we Walk it out. Can you say a good amen? He proclaimed, Philip proclaimed the gospel. Let's set it in our hearts to proclaim it too. Let's share this good message. Let's make sure we share it with how we live and then the words that we speak. Secondly, Philip exercised the gifts of the Spirit. And how many of you know you do not have to have R-E-V in front of your name in order for the Holy Spirit to use you in prayer? Come on, say a good amen. Philip was used in the gifts of the Spirit. Remember, once again, he wasn't an apostle. He wasn't one of the disciples from early in Jesus' ministry. He was a deacon who was open to allowing God to use him. Healing and deliverance were part of the evidence that Philip was filled and flowing with the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus promised, greater works than these will you do. Now, he wasn't talking about quantity or quality. Forgive me. Jesus wasn't talking about quality. Who can, who can raise the dead and do something better than that? Who can feed 5,000 people with a couple loaves of bread and a couple of fish? What's better than that? How, how, if it was quality, I think what Jesus was talking when he said greater works, he was talking about quantity. Because when Jesus walked the earth, he limited himself to time and space. He could only be in one place at one time. But 12 went out. And the works that he was doing were multiplied by 12. And later, 70 went out. And the works that he was doing was multiplied by 70. And later, 120 went out. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. The gifts of the Spirit are still promised to us and through us today. We need the word and prayer. We need faith today. I was uh, sharing we, in, a, in a, one of our recent presbytery meetings, and, and one of our presbyters was sharing that in his church there was a, a gal who had dozens, I believe he said over 50 tumors. She had cancer and she was battling it, and the doctors hadn't given her much hope. But they prayed. And when she went for her next scan, they were gone. Yeah. And you know when the medical community uses the word miracle, what they're saying is medical science cannot explain this outcome. Thank God. He still answers prayer. We need to trust God. We need to trust him with the outcomes. How many of you know there are more people healed in churches that pray for the sick than in, the, the, than in churches that don't? We keep we say, well, not, how, why is it that everybody doesn't get healed? I wish I knew. I, I wish that there was a simple answer. But there isn't. 
The bottom line is we pray in faith, believing, and we trust the results to him who doeth all things well. Can I get a good amen? I liked what Pastor Tim talked about this morning when he talked about moving mountains. There are qualifications to those promises that when we pray, we'll say to this mountain, be removed. Well, you know, if it was willy-nilly and just based upon our will, uh, one person would be cast in that mountain over there, and that person said, I don't want it on my property, and he cast it back over here. And, and it would be a very confusing world if, if, if God just gave us carte blanche authority and power to do whatever entered into our hearts and minds, Right? How many of you know there's some prayers that we pray that upon reflection they don't get answered the way we wanted them answered and we're glad? I'm glad God doesn't answer every prayer the way we pray them because if I can be plain, we'd screw things up with some of the things that we ask for. I know that uh, the other day there were about a million, no, about 300 million people praying to win that lottery. And the re First of all, trust God. That's a better approach than buying a lottery ticket. I wouldn't mind having $1.1 billion. All the good we could do with it. And if you read articles, you find out that people who win the lottery, many go through tragic life consequences to those winnings. But we'd still like a crack at it, right? I'm glad God doesn't answer every prayer the way we pray them. We have to trust him for the outcome. But here's the deal. When we, when we look at Philip's life and he was a man of faith and he prayed for the sick and they recovered, there were those who were uh, demonized, there were those who were encumbered with demonic spirits and they were, they were loosed and relieved and delivered from those things and God was answering prayer 2,000 years ago and I'm glad to say that God answers prayer today as well. The third thing is that Philip had a positive impact in his community. There was a noticeable impact resulting from this full gospel ministry, namely great joy. There was great joy in that city. When the church is living and proclaiming the gospel out loud in the marketplace, in the neighborhood, among the family, great joy will be experienced. One can only imagine that when healing and deliverance are experienced, there's certainly going to be great joy. Of course, everything wasn't perfect. As we read on through chapter 8, there was a fellow named Simon. He was a sorcerer, and he tried to bribe the apostles offering them money so that he would have the same kind of power that they have. And I love Peter, and Peter the impulsive. He looked at Simon and said, Simon, your money perish with you. You better go and ask God to forgive you for even conceiving such a thing in your heart, and maybe he'll be gracious and forgive you of your sin. And Simon did. You know, sometimes we have, to, we have to just say it like it is. But Peter used his authority to straighten out Simon's unethical behavior. That's a sermon for another day. And the church dodged a second bullet right after chapter 4 is chapter 5. Isn't that a surprise? But in the beginning of chapter 5, there was uh, uh, the initiation of a hypocrisy by people claiming to be more generous than what they were actually being in order to put on an air, and it was, it was a bad day. But the church got through that too. Now, the church has never been perfect. Even in its earliest days, there were bumps along the way that they had to manage. But God will always help us manage the bumps that we encounter. 
How does our story, our witness, influence and impact our circle of uh, uh, influence? In our workplace, in our hobby place, in, in the gym, at the family reunion. I'll never forget when I was uh, in Bible school and uh, our family had come to Jesus as a, as a unit. We all got saved within a week of each other, within a couple of weeks of each other, I should say. And um, about six or eight months after I got saved, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And shortly after that, I, I felt the Lord leading me to go into ministry. And uh, so I was now in college, and I was at a family reunion. And I, I'll never forget, as I was walking into the kitchen to get more food... Got to work on the pulpit bumper. <laughs> and uh, I heard one of my aunts say, can you believe he's going to be a minister? Uh, my Aunt Marg, she's, she's with the Lord now. But there was a distinct difference in a little ornery boy's life than a Bible college student's life. And I think of the old hymn that says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. How about you? Has there been a change? Celebrate that change. Don't brag on it. That doesn't look good. But celebrate it. Live it out. Live it out loud. Don't be afraid to pray for your unsaved loved ones, your neighbors, your co-workers when they're going through times of difficulty and trial. You know, uh, the, the whole coronavirus, this whole COVID thing gave the church a tremendous opportunity. Now, we were stuck inside along with everybody else. I get that. Most everybody still, you know, put a mask on when requested or required to do so. And we washed our hands to keep the germs off. That didn't hurt too much. But what we had was a chance to talk to people about eternity. There's going to be times where culture and society and even the news are going to, it's going to open up the door for us to talk about the current goings on. A couple of weeks ago on a Monday night, there was a football player who got thumped in the chest and fell over a few seconds later. And you remember, all the teams in the NFL were gathering in prayer circles to, to pray. That's a moment for us. That's a moment for the church to say, no, no, don't criticize. Oh, yeah, of course. When So there's a tragedy. Everybody wants to get on there. No, oh, no, 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 no. There's an opportunity to say, you know, all of us are going to be on our back someday. There's going to come a time for all of us when we're going to need other people to pray for us. I'm glad. I'm glad we serve a God in heaven who loves us and he's gracious and he wants to forgive us of our sins and give us a place in heaven. It seems like the conversation surrounding that football player, it seems like he's a believer. That's what I'm hearing or sensing from it. If that be the case, take the positive and run with it. And share Jesus in all of these situations, no matter what bad thing comes along. You know, we can always not just try to cast it in a positive. Some things can't be cast in a positive. Somebody dies a tragic death, that's hard. But we can always point, the Holy Spirit can always inspire us to point people to the Savior. I want to encourage you today. Be like Philip. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with discernment, wisdom. Be a person of good reputation in your families and in your circles and among your co-workers and in your community. Let's be like this so that we can see those kinds of results. 
Because a few verses later in verse 12, it says, Multitudes came to the Lord and were baptized as a result. There, you, you, you are on the fringe of McKeesport. You think there are any people in McKeesport who need Jesus? Here in North Versailles, are there people who need Jesus? In your family unit, are there people who need Jesus? God, give us a spirit of wisdom, discernment, and boldness to step forward into the moments that are created for us so that we can preach the good news. We can pray for the sick. We can pray for the mentally ill. We can pray for those who are, who are uh, encumbered with uh, demonic spirits. And God will use us to show them a way out. This morning, I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come back. And let's, let's speak the name of Jesus as we bring our service to a close. And would you just uh, uh, look inside and ask yourself this question. Are there opportunities that I may be missing to speak the name of Jesus in my family or in my workplace, in my neighborhood? Are there opportunities that I might take advantage of, if you'll allow me that phrase, 